something really valuable and important. Maybe it uh, could have been a smartphone, a purse, or a wallet, and then you spent hours, maybe days, searching for it, pursuing, trying to find out what happened to it. Well, I can remember when I was a kid, uh, I had a special wallet that I lost on one or two occasions. Now, this is one of those wonderful and unique toys that, that only people who grew up in the 80s and 90s, I think, can, can fully appreciate. Um, it was a wallet made of a blue hard plastic, and, and it, was, it was hinged in the middle with a little latch to keep it closed, and then get this a string through the top so you can hang it around your neck. <laughs> now, see, back in the 90s, I wasn't jumping on the whole fanny pack bandwagon, all right? No, it was, it was the necklace wallet, right? <laughs> Now, believe it or not, this, this sort of wallet was more prone to getting lost. You know, you're checking out, you take it off and open it up and you to make sure to put it back on again. Anyway, so like, there, were, there were times when we drive back to the store, try to find out what had happened, search the house carefully. Well, tonight we're looking at a story that Jesus told about someone who, who loses something of great value and goes to great trouble to search for it and to find it again. Now, to, to set the scene, we're going to be, we're going to be in, in Luke chapter 15, like Matt said, and uh, in verses 8 through 10. But just to set the scene, in the opening verses, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes are grumbling and complaining because tax collectors and sinners are coming to Jesus and listening to him and eating with him. And Jesus is welcoming them. He is teaching them and calling them to repent and believe. And the religious leaders of the day aren't happy about that. They, uh, yeah, they're just, they're, they're, they're kind of annoyed, they're kind of disappointed in Jesus. And so Jesus responds to them, not with a sermon or a lecture, but he, he goes through this cycle of three parables, uh, which the parable is just an extended illustration or metaphor. Um, usually has just one main point. And the first parable that Jesus tells us is that the one of the lost sheep, where the, the shepherd leaves the 99 to go and find the one. And the second parable that we're looking at tonight is about the lost coin. And then the third, which Ryan Talman is going to preach on next month, uh, is the lost son, or commonly known as the prodigal son. And so uh, we're going to pick up in verse 8. And Jesus says, What woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not buy the land and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she is found, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is God's word. So what do we see in this just a short little parable, three verses? Well, uh, to begin with, this, this woman has lost a uh, silver coin, uh, I call it a, a drachma, which is uh, about equivalent to the Roman denarius, if you've ever, ever heard about those in, in a Bible uh, lesson. But it was worth about one day's wages for, for a day laborer. So, so don't really think of a coin, you know, for our day and age. Think of a misplacing a $50 or $100 Okay, so she, she lights the lamp, she sweeps the entire house, and, and she won't stop searching. Because, I mean, if you lose a hundred dollar bill, you're not just going to shrug your shoulders and say, eh, I guess it's gone. No, you're, you're going to turn over all the furniture, you're going to go through all those piles of papers. Uh, another thing we see here is that finding the lost coin brings joy and celebration. So when she finds the coin, the woman calls her friends and neighbors to join in celebration. So with this story, this parable, Jesus is drawing a comparison in order to make a point to the scribes and the Pharisees. Here's a woman who loses a precious coin, and then here's her reaction when she finds it again. Now, God is like this woman. When one lost sinner repents, it's as if God has regained something of great value, and he rejoices over that person. And, and then we see that the Pharisees, the religious leaders who, who boasted in their own righteousness, who, who view themselves, 
themselves as having this inside track with God. They were grumbling and complaining about Jesus associating with sinners. And they, they wanted to keep those kind of people at arm's length. But by, by telling this parable, and this whole series of parables, Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees. He's saying to them, and, and, and he's saying to us as well, my Father in heaven rejoices in the presence of the angels when just one sinner repents. Just like the woman calls her friends and neighbors to rejoice with her, God calls you to rejoice with him. So, so for us as, as the Gathering Church, as Lens Baptist, um, as believers here in the, uh, the 21st century, how do we obey the word of Christ? How do we join the Father in his joyful celebration? How do we rejoice in the grace of God toward repentant sinners? And that's kind of uh, the, the main thrust of what I want to look at, kind of answer that question. How do we rejoice in the grace of God toward repentant sinners? And so just for a few points of application for us to, to think about together. First of all, one way we do that is by joining God in His mission, in His search and rescue mission. So one of the most profound ways we'll be able to join the Father in rejoicing and celebrating over repentant sinners is if we have participated in the search. When our, when our hearts and wills are aligned with God's will, then we identify with His joy over the restoration of the sinner. And then we, we join Him in the task of searching for the lost sinner who needs to be restored to the Father. Uh, one commentator writes about this parable. He says, Recovering a lost sinner can take diligent effort, but the effort is worth it when the lost is found. Sinners should know that God is diligently looking for them. Disciples should diligently engage in the search for sinners on behalf of the Master they serve. Finding lost sheep and missing coins is the disciples' priority. Jesus involved himself with sinners, so should disciples. Now, you know, I am definitely preaching to myself on this point. Just sometimes it's it's just really hard to speak up uh, and to speak out. But I believe that, that one of the most important things that, that we can do and we can seek to grow in is, is praying, praying for God to align our hearts and wills uh, with his and to pray specifically for opportunities to engage with unbelievers, to, to get to know them, to show the love of Christ to them, and to, to testify out of our own lives the grace that God has shown us, and then to be able to share the gospel with them. And I firmly believe that if we pray for this, God will answer, and He'll also give us the love and the courage, the boldness, and the words to speak. Second point of application, how do we rejoice in God's grace towards sinners? We, we do it in our corporate worship. Uh, we celebrate and rejoice in God's grace when we gather as a church, uh, when we sing, as we just did, amazing grace. We're celebrating our gracious God, who, who Zephaniah 3.17 says, He rejoices over us with singing. We're magnifying the Savior who welcomes in tax collectors and sinners, outcasts and outsiders, the lowly and the poor, the rejected. So this is how we join in the Father's celebration over those who are lost and now and found. And, and when we see, uh, as we just recently did, repentant sinners baptized and brought into the church, as we take the Lord's Supper together and proclaim Christ's death until He comes, and as we hear God's word preached, we seek in all that to magnify and to hold up the mercy of God, reminding ourselves and each other of the gospel, and also holding it out for anyone who might come along and hear God's gracious call. Uh, number three, or how about another way that we can rejoice in God's grace towards sinners? Well, we rejoice that he saved others. We rejoice that he saved others. We join the Father in celebrating uh, what we hear in Revelation, the salvation of people from every tribe and tongue and nation. But you know what? Those people are often not like us. You know, they, they come from different backgrounds. Their personalities are different. Um, their, their besetting sins are sometimes different than ours. And, and sometimes it just seems like we don't have much in common apart from 
Jesus Christ. And, and as we heard this morning in the, in the sermon about forgiveness from Matthew 5, sometimes our fellow redeemed sinners will offend or hurt or annoy us. And so we have to consider the mercy that God has shown us in Christ. And then we likewise forgive. We likewise show mercy to others. We rejoice that God saved them. They are our brothers and sisters, and they have received the same mercy that we received. And then fourth and finally, um, how do we rejoice in God's grace towards sinners? Well, we rejoice in our own salvation. We celebrate and rejoice the magnificent grace and mercy that God displayed when He saved us personally and individually. He saved me. He saved you. We, we meditate on the depth of our sin, our rebellion, our, our desperate state when we were dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1 tells us. And then we marvel at the great lengths that He went to find us and give us life and bring us back to God. This is the gospel. This is what we need to hear again and again. There is an unimaginable grace that's found in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. The friend of sinners who welcomes home the lost and celebrates their return. But this grace and this forgiveness comes at a great cost to himself. It's possible only because the judgment for sinners was poured out on him. On the cross, he died the death we deserve, taking the place of all those who would turn from their sin and trust in him. And after three days, God raised him from the dead, proving he had conquered sin and death, and he will return in glory, and he will welcome us into his eternal kingdom. So here is, is a marvelous thought. On the day when we turn from our sin, and trust in Christ, our Father in heaven, just like this, this woman who found her precious coin that she was depending on. Our Father in heaven rejoiced over us. So in the gospel, we find reason to be truly joyful and thankful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this just this, this simple little story that Jesus told, and yet there's so much uh, emotion and so much uh, just profound uh, meaning in, in, in that the Jesus would compare the God of the universe to this woman and, and to say that he rejoices when a sinner repents. And so we, we praise you, we thank you for our own salvation, we thank you for the mercy you've shown mercy you've shown to others here and in our, in our church. And we pray for those who do not yet know you. We pray that they too would, would come home, that they would be found by you, that they would return to, to the gracious and merciful God who has made a way for them. We pray that you use us in, in that mission, in that work that you are about. We pray all these